Good morning, everybody. It's, it's wonderful to, for us to be able to join uh, together and with the Lord. So let's, let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we've, we've gathered together, certainly in the Spirit this morning. We've come together as a family, not just uh, as an earthly family, but indeed a heavenly fa a family, one that has been born of God himself. And so, Father, as, as those that have the, the very seed of your nature, your life, your very DNA, your essence within us, Father, we join with you and with one another as we celebrate the wonderfulness, the superiority, the, etern the eternal word of God that is the same yesterday, today and forever. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Thank you that you haven't just left us isolated, but you've given us the opportunity to, to join, even digitally, even virtually, in our many homes through the wonderful uh, ability of technology. So, Father, this morning as we come before you, we ask for each and every one of us to be at rest, to be at peace. I pray, Father, that... Every single body will just have a supernatural peace and rest from all pain, sickness, disease, so that your word, Father, will, will not be distracted from in any way whatsoever. Father, give us the ability in the Spirit to be able to see and to hear things that far supersede the natural mind. So we thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well... Welcome, everybody. I really, really mean that. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to gather together, even if it is like, like this. Um, personally, I, 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 well, it doesn't matter what I, what I think personally um, about when we, we will be able to get back again together um, in the physical. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that by June, um, but my guess is as good as yours. But you know what? Regardless of what happens and regardless of all the things that are changing around us, the, the one thing we know that never changes is the Word of God. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. So we are eternally thankful that we are of His people, of His family, that know His Word, that feed on His Word and that live by His Word. Um, I, I consider myself, and I'm sure you do the same, extremely fortunate I don't know why the Lord chose me I don't know why the Lord reached out and was so merciful and gave me the ability to respond to his grace um, we just say thank you Lord amen and I'm sure that's for every one of us now I know that <coughs> excuse me I know that each and every one of you are in various circumstances and I know that for a number it's extremely difficult. But I, I just want to remind you that um, his word is in our heart. Our heads may be challenged from time to time, but not our hearts. Our hearts are filled with the word of God. We are born of the Spirit. And if we will just tap into that supernatural ability within us to rise up and to respond, to act, to be who we have been created to be. Do you remember we are named, we have been renamed at our birth, and so we have a new identity, we have a new function. So we, we have a new character, a nature, we have a new job description, and it's not about all the things that the world um, would have us to believe. Our privilege is being called sons of God. Amen. So this, this week, um, in fact tomorrow, um, excuse me. <coughs> tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we are we are going to be. This is just a little announcement for for all of you. Um, tomorrow morning, we are going to be opening up the online Bible school. Um, the students that registered as uh, 2020 students this year, whether it's at the main campus or um, a satellite school, hopefully all the people have been contacted. And you will join us online for your first lecture, which will 
which will basically be at the beginning of term two. We know we're a little bit late, um, but nevertheless we've had a lot of work to do. And I just want to thank our staff for all the work and the effort that they've put in over these last few days to contact everybody to get everything ready. And so we're looking for a wonderful, wonderful time together there, virtually as a Bible school. All right, we're going to be continuing this morning, <coughs> excuse me, with a subject that I've been dealing with for some time entitled Back to Basics. Um, I had a thought this morning and I've actually made a note of it that either today or tomorrow, as soon as I can, I'm going to make a summary of all the major points, I believe, that we've discussed in these, what, five, six weeks together when we've been dealing with this subject, Back to Basics. And I'm going to put them on our website um, next to the audio messages on, on, on this particular subject, subject. And you'll be able to download the PDF version um, in summary form of the major points because th these points are so important and we're building upon them, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept. And sometimes we can forget what we've learnt, and what we've learnt doesn't help us to go forward in the next steps where we are. So I'll put that up there as soon as, as, as I possibly can, hopefully even, even today. This, this morning there's a, sub, there's a subtitle, if you would, for Back to Basics, and it's Divine Principles. Right? Divine Principles. I want us to read together, so I hope you've got your physical Bible again. I want us to read from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. Very well known scripture I might add. But let's read it together. You know it's, it's, it's so awesome that every time we read the word of God we can find, um, we can find revealed to us. Not just us finding it. But the Lord reveals as we would be hungry and we would search for, for the things of the Lord. We, we find new things. You know, his mercies are new every day. Amen. So it says, <coughs> excuse me, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Notice it says all scripture. It doesn't say all books. We've got a lot of books, or we did have a lot of books in, in our library, my wife and I. We had a lot of books here, and also we had a lot of books at the church, um, in, 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 our bookshop, in our bookshop. And we had to get rid of them. We had to literally destroy them, because um, not all books are biblical, as much as it grieves us to say that. But we've got to be very careful what we read, what we ingest, what we take, what we feast upon will adjust our lifestyle. And so be very careful what you, what you read. Make sure that it is scriptural. If you're not sure, then don't read it. If you'd like a little bit of advice, you know, you're, you're welcome to contact um, one of us. You know, there, there's many people in the church, I'm sure now, particularly as, a, as Bible school students, you know what is sound and what is, what is solid and what is uh, helpful and what is not helpful. So let's make sure that we have all scripture that is inspired by God. Um, and it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction and training in righteousness. All scripture obviously refers to the Old and the New Testament. So it's every book of the Bible. There's 66 books in the Bible. And some, some of them are probably still yet to be discovered by some of you, like Obadiah or Nahum. Um, some of you think, Obadiah? Is, he, is, that, is that a book? Yes, it's a book in the Bible, and it's well worth, worth reading. But my point is this. Every scripture, from Genesis to the book of the Revelation, remember, it's not revelations, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, that's what it says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. It's not about the Antichrist, it's not about you know the wars. It's not about a whole lot of things. It's about the revelation. It reveals Christ to us. It's a difficult book. 
it's a scriptural, it's obviously, you know, it's part of scripture, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a book that needs to be interpreted through the many signs, symbols, um, hidden truths, by understanding their meanings which are given to us, also in cryptic form, all the way through the rest of the Bible. So all, the whole entirety of, of scripture is given to us by God. These are God's breath that comes to us. It's the inspired word of God. These words have life, not death. You know, there's some books that you can read. Those words will bring you death. They'll bring you um, fear. They'll bring you condemnation. They'll bring a whole lot of terrible things to you. But God's word will correct. It will inspire. It will correct for righteousness. In other words, the word of God, the word of God, every scripture will correct you and me to be able to live in the, to, to the design that God has created us to, to, to live before him with. Okay, so it says all scripture. By the way, when Paul said this, because Paul actually penned this, he says all scripture, he was, much of the New Testament had not been written. So he was definitely referring to, um, at that time particularly, the Old Testament. Testament. The point is this, and I want to read now from 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse, verse 20. The point is this, is that the Old Testament is also inspired by God. 2 Peter 1 verse 20 says, But know this, that first of all, first of all, first, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. We have to be so careful. Every single one of us. Unfortunately, there's, there's so many prophetic words that are, are given even today. Probably even this morning. Um, as I'm speaking, there's, 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 there's people that are giving prophetic words that are not of God. You know, it, it would be very easy for, for, for me to say something and just to, you know, speak it out from my heart, from my mind, from my intellect, from my own understanding, from my own thoughts and fe feelings. And then at the end of it, say, thus saith the Lord. Where, where, as in, where, where in fact, it was only thus said John. And John's word is not going to help you. Um, it's the word of God that is going to inspire, in, to correct and to train us. In, in righteousness. So we have to be very careful that um, we position ourselves in a place where we know that no prophecy is of private interpretation. In other words, you, you can't just turn the scriptures, not even a little bit. We have to be very, very careful. We are, we are so careful. Sue and myself have been so careful all the years. I know that many of you have as well. We, 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 we take great care. Um, you know, there's, there's some shops that you can go to and you, you could pick up some food, but you look at it and you think, that doesn't look too good. Well, you know, we, we, have, a, we have sense in the natural not to eat um, food that could hurt us. Well, let's have enough sense in the spiritual to make sure that we stick to the Word of God. Now, I, I, I want to um, I want us to go to, I think, turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read there. Um, as you turn there, Paul's view of the Old Testament, this is, this is his view that he gave to us. Um, it was very much of, Paul looked at the Old Testament and viewed it as a divine setup. This is an incredible thing, and, and it's mesmerized me. It, it's absolutely fascinated me over the years when, I, when I've realized that everything that happened in the Old Testament, I've said this so many times, I know, but let me say it again. Everything that happened in the Old Testament happened physically, it, in reality. It was there. Every person that was named was a real person. Every city that they went to was a real city. Every pestilence or famine or disaster that was there. It happened. It was real. The walls of Jericho physically fell down. All those ten plagues that came before Pharaoh to, you know, that hardened his heart um, when, 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 when God was 
releasing his people from under his uh, uh, rulership. Everything happened there. But everything happened and God set it up to be absolute examples to, to you and me. It was a divine setup for them that would help us in the New Testament as New Testament believers. In, uh, you don't have to turn there, but I, I just want to quote Romans 15 verse 4. Paul says, <clears throat> For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Okay? I've said that because the Bible says that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established. And that means every word, even in the Bible, it must be established by a second witness. Okay? Very powerful truth there. But let me read for you now, as you, as you follow, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate of the same spiritual food. And all ate, so and all drank from the same spiritual rock. See all the oars? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, say most of them, but with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That was their focus. That it, was, it, was, it was all about self-gratification. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, look at this, one day, 23,000 fell. At the moment, we keep on hearing, um, certainly across, across the world, the numbers of figures, that are di figures of people, the numbers of people that are dying um, on a daily basis. Um, here, we have a reality where 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these things, not some of them, all of them, all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. You know, what, what strikes me here is that it's possible for you and me to experience some amazing journey in God. To, to be part of an incredible body of, 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 that belongs to Him. And yet, God would, could say this of us, that He was not happy with the most of them. That, that would be a terrible, a terrible thought to think that maybe that could be possibly um, addressed to you and me. But this is why we study the Word of God. This is why we lay our lives before the Lord. Um, can I just remind you here, because of what we said, I think it was last week, It was uh, the, the, the focus was that we have to know His ways and not His works. These people, they knew his works, but they didn't know him. They didn't know his ways. And obviously Isaiah 55, I think it's around about verse 8, where it says, um, my thoughts are not your thoughts, um, my ways are not your ways. And obviously in John chapter 14, the Bible says, uh, Jesus says, he says, I am the way. That word way in the Greek is the word hodos. It speaks about the method that the, the road walked. But when, when we speak about wanting to know his ways, it's not about, um, it's not so, so much the outward method of doing something. It's about the internal configuration that causes the way that he uh, conducts himself. The way that he lives, the way, who he is, his character, his nature. But it's because of 
the internal configuration. So they knew his works, but they didn't know his, his ways. And we, we have to know his, his ways. Now, in, in that passage there, it says, Now these things happened, these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things. Now, that word lust speaks of excessive cravings. It's, it's not necessarily speaking about sexual lust. Obviously, it could include that. But there's a lot of other lusts that we have to deal with. For example, lusting after food. You know, I think in this, in this lockdown period, one of the, one of the difficulties um, that I think we all find that is not locked down, that refuses to get locked down, is our refrigerator. You know, and I find myself even being drawn to the refrigerator um, to get snacks and to find something of, of you know, that's just, just titillating. But you've got to be careful, haven't you? You know, I mean, I keep getting on the scale and I say, whoa, I've got to stop. And I do. But, you know, there's, there's the lust after food. There's the lust after things, money, what money can buy, to, to lust after, uh, you know, what, what natural protection could give you, to lust after position, after reputation, after all the things that, that the world could give us. So be, be very careful. You know, I'm a firm believer, and you've heard me, this is one of my favourite passages um, from 1 Corinthians 15, first the natural, then the spiritual. So if we do not control ourselves um, well in the natural, we will not be well disciplined in the, in the things of the Spirit. So we may, th we may view something like um, lack of control in the area of just eating as something that's not very important. Believe me, it is very important. Don't lust after evil things. I'm not calling food evil, but that word lust is excessive craving. So don't let your body excessively crave after anything that it shouldn't do. All right? then, then also it says, nor let us commit sexual immorality. And, and it was sexual immorality that caused 23,000 of them to die in one day. So as I mentioned last, last week, let's be careful. Let's be careful of of, of, of what we would open the door to. You can open the door to um, sexual immorality in so many ways, in your mind, in your heart, through books, through, uh, uh, through the internet, through television, um, and I'm sure in, in many ways. But the Bible says, nor let us commit sexual immorality. Then it also says, nor complain as some of them also complained. Now, we've, we've got a situation in our country and certainly in the world where uh, it would be so easy to pick up on something and to murmur, mumble and moan. So there you go. Don't murmur, don't murmur mumble or moan. It's quite a tongue twister. You can say it with me. I'm not going to I'm not going to murmur, mumble, or moan. Okay, um, I'm not going to mumble or moan or complain um, about what's happening around me. Let's develop our faith and peace. You know, the Bible says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So if the kingdom of God is ruling in our hearts, how could we get into this murmur, mumbling, and moaning? And, you know, and if we were to do that, if we were to let ourselves run off into that direction. Fear is the next step. And fear is not of, of God. Okay? The Bible says perfect love, which is God. God's nature. The nature of God casts out perfect. Uh, the perfect, perfect love casts out fear. So the nature of God casts out all of that. So we, we, we mustn't let ourselves um, even begin to murmur and mumble and moan. You know what happens if... If a, if a soldier on the front line um, began, begins to show fear to his regiment, you know what they do to that soldier? They remove him. Not for his sake, but for the sake of the whole company in which he is. 
because that little bit of feel begins to erode morality. It begins to erode strength and focus on, on the task at hand. And so if there's somebody, you know, it could be anybody, hey, in our home, and if we're beginning to moan and mumble and complain and, and just, you know, become a, mm, you know, a sour lemon, before long, the whole environment gets shifted and changed. Let's, let's allow the kingdom of God to rule in our hearts and our homes. Amen? Okay, now, in, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11, the, the, the verse 11 it says, Now all these things happen to them as examples, and they were written for our, our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have, have come. The desires, the plans, the purposes of God will reach culmination. It will reach maturity. It will come to fruition. It will reach its goal. There, it's not going to go on forever and ever and ever. What God, has what God said would take place. In other words, Gen Genesis 1.26. When God says, let us make man in our image and likeness and let them have dominion. That will take place. It's not going to be a goal that will never be reached. Now, we could be part of that generation. The, the utmost ending, the utmost fulfillment of that goal may not come upon my life. It may not come upon your life. It could. Who knows what's going to take place? What, what God can do, you know, the Bible speaks of suddenly something happens. And um, I, I know that there's a long way to go. In, you know, in, in terms of our growth. But suddenlies are there in the Bible. And suddenlies, God can do wonderful things in, 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 in our lives. And we can find ourselves um, in really in that position that this particular verse says, upon whom the ends of the ages have, have come. The ends of the ages have come upon the church. And that's upon you and me. Now, if God's goal is to be reached, if, his, if, the, if finality is going to be reached, if maturity is going to be attained, then it's going to come upon a people who allow divine biblical thoughts to shape. So, um, if, these, if, 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 matur if the maturation... If, if the end of God's goal is going to come to, to, to the finish, it will come to a people who allow divine biblical principles to shape our thoughts and our behavior. Are you with me there? I'm saying that for, for, us, to come, for us to reach the, the end of the goal for God, the Bible has to shape all the scriptures of the Word of God, the entirety of the Word of God, must shape these principles, these divine principles, must shape my heart, my thinking, my, 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 my belief system, and hence my, my behavior. And so to do that, we've obviously got to study both the Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus himself endorsed the value of the, of the Old Testament. In Matthew 5 and verse 17, he says, Don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus came and was the example to us of how every requirement of the divine laws of God could be fulfilled in a physical body. Isn't that incredible? And so, as, as, and I'm always reminded, I think it's in, in Hebrews chapter 5, where the Bible says, um, um, and he looked for a body. Mm -hmm. And the body, the, the first body that was, was fully compliant with the divine will of God was obviously the, the single body of Jesus Christ. But now Jesus has died, he's rose, um, he's resurrected, he's now glorified, and we are the body of Christ. The most wonderful gift that we can give to God is our body for his work, 
for his pleasure and for, for his satisfaction. So um, that's, that's Jesus' comments. He says, uh, I, I didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets, I came to fulfill them. I, come, I came to show you that every aspect of the law was, is possible to be f fulfilled and to be complied with um, in, in a body that's actually given to, to, to the Lord. Now, now, that was like the background. I want us to look this morning, you can turn, and turn please in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. I want us to look at the technique of divine revelation. The technique of divine revelation. The, the, the question that we could ask ourselves is this. If we love God, if we want to know more about him, how can we know him the, you know, in the most best possible way? How can we find God? How can we know God? How can we uh, get to know God in, in, in the most awesome way that is possible? How can we get to know God in the way that God wants us to know him? There you go. Hmm? We know that the Bible says um, in a number of passages, uh, uh, Proverbs 25 verse 2 says that it's the glory of God, it's the nature, it's the character, this is what he, how, he, how he operates. It's the glory of God to hide a thing, to hide himself in the scriptures. But it's the glory of God, but it's the glory of, of the, 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 the sons of God, the kings in the earth, to search out a matter. So God has hidden himself in the scriptures. Every, every verse, every chapter, every name, every number, every city, every, um, every circumstance that took place, God has hidden himself in that. And it's for you and for me to find out what God is saying to us in those hieroglyphics, in those hidden meanings, in those, uh, in those letters and numbers that mean so, so much. So, in Luke chapter 24, it, it contains incredible principles of how we can uh, have, get divine revelation of, of God. And I want to read it. It's a lengthy passage, but um, and I thought, should I read? I'm not going to read the whole of, of, of this passage, but I'm going to read a, a substantial part. Luke 24 and verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women were, a certain other women with them, came to the tomb, bringing in the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb, and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary, Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Sure. But, here's typical Peter. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves. And he departed, marvelling to himself at what had happened. Now, this is, this, is where I, this is where I want us to focus on. Look at this. Now behold, two of them were travelling that same day. Now, at first glance, we would think two, it was two of the disciples. But it, well, it was two of the disciples, but it wasn't two of the twelve. It was not two of the twelve. Because later on, I'm not sure if we're, if we're going to get there, we probably won't today, we'll actually find that these two found the other 11. Okay? Um, so they couldn't have, you know, obviously it's the 11 because Judas is now, you know, he's, he's hung, he, he hung himself. He hung himself. 
Um, so, but these two were not of the original, were not the twelve uh, uh, apostles. Now behold, two of them were travelling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things that had, which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of a conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And, and, you, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with, him, who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But him, they didn't see. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones! <laughs> you, you know, I can say a number of things there. So you fool, you foolish ones! What a, what a category, what an adjective to, to describe by Jesus, to be described by Jesus. O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Look. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Okay? This, this, this chapter is an amazing chapter. It, it, it is one of those chapters in, 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 in the Bible, honestly. Um, it, is, it, 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 is, it, is, it, it ought to be, in my, in my view, it ought to be capitalised and, and in bold print all the way through. It is such an important thing. You know, what we have here, I know that in, 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 in other places, particularly in the other Gospels towards the end, you have... Um, various accounts, a lot less in detail than this one, of the time when Jesus has now risen and uh, they haven't seen him and then we have this appearance and then at the end of the chapter, we haven't read it now obviously, but then Jesus uh, is actually, um, he, he goes to be with his father and that's the last that they're going, that they're going to see of him physically. Um, and so in, in, in this chapter, we have divine principles of the technique that God now inaugurates, that he sets in motion for you and me to be able to have divine revelations of, of God. This is, everything is, is in this chapter. And I think that there's more than what we've obviously ever possibly understood before. So I, I trust that we're going to... Um, we're going to be blessed and encouraged and instructed this this morning through through his word. But um, so this chapter reveals the method through which God will now reveal Himself. There's a method here, and there's a number of different principles that we're going to bring out, not just. The four pillars of an apostolic people. There, there's, there, you know, I know that many of you know those four pillars, and certainly that is embedded in that. And possibly we'll look at that, or uh, partly um, as 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 the as the days progress. But there's other principles here that I want us to be able to see and appreciate, um, and to obviously put into into action in our own lives, so that we do not miss the divine principles that, that are there for us to, to find if only we would be compliant with his divine principles.
principles here. So, he shows us the method. Now, in brief, let, let, let me say this. The way that God reveals himself to these two disciples is that he leads himself out of the scriptures. That word lead, or you know, depending on the translation that's, uh, uh, that, that, that you actually have, what, what Jesus actually does is that he explains thoroughly. That's the, that's the, 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 Greek, the Greek meaning of that particular passage there where he says um, he expounded to them in the New King James. This is in verse 27. He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That word expounded means that he explains thoroughly thoroughly the things concerning himself. So um, this is what we want to, to look at. Let, let me just try to put, put yourself in the picture here. There's two of the disciples and they're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus and it's about 12 kilometers. You know, the Bible says about seven miles, but you know, in, 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 for distance, for understanding. It's, and, and I know it's not about the distance because the seven is very pertinent. But the, um, uh, the distance is 12 kilometers. And so here's Jesus. He, he joins himself to these two disciples so that he can expound, he can explain thoroughly all the scriptures. So there's quite a, quite a journey here. Now, so we're going to look at this, this passage and we're going to discover some principles that, that, that are in there. The first principle is oneness. First principle for divine revelation of God is oneness. Note there's two disciples. Two certainly speak of witness, it speaks of test testimony, but it also speaks of oneness. It speaks of agreement. All right? The Bible says in Amos 3.3, 3, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Unless they, they are set on the same path, unless they are walking together in the same way. In, in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says, For this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two of them shall become one flesh. So the oneness here is the unity, the, together, the togetherness, the agreement uh, is, 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 is very important. So the, the, the atmosphere the environment of agreement, of oneness, not moan, murmuring, mumbling or moaning. Um, that, that attitude, that, that environment of, of being one with God, of, of, of agreement, um, of, of again with submission to one another. You know, if we're fighting one another, there's two of you. But if you come together, you submit to one another, don't you? So we submit ourselves to, to the Lord. So I want us to see here the principle of oneness. And this really is, is, is the, the focus for, for this morning. This, this, this environment of, of, of oneness with God. Being at peace with God. And with one another. These two were one. The opposite is like a shut door. Isn't it? Where there's, where there's disunity, uh, moaning, um, disturbances in the spirit, where there's strife, disunity, it's like the door is shut. You know, if there's a, if, if, if we looked at a number of churches, and we say, well, let's go to this church, or that church, or the other church, and I think we've all probably been into many churches, and uh, had, had, uh, we have um, history or testimonies, of what we have seen and I, I, I've had that experience as well of being in a church where there was not agreement there was not unity there was not oneness there was strife and contentions and factions and that yeah in, in I want you to hear in that environment the divine revelations of God are shut whatever comes through is going to be extremely limited now, yes, that can happen in the church, in, in a church, in a, in a physical church building, you know. You, you understand what I'm speaking about. I know that we are the church, but 
when we bring it in, 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 into the microcosm, into our homes, if, if you want the kingdom of God to, to rule and to reign and to, to enjoy his blessings, his provision, his protection, his power, his beauty, his love, his peace, his grace, his joy in your heart, there's, there has to be an environment that is set which is one of agreement. Husbands and wives, I've already quoted the scripture, husbands and wives, they become one. They can't be strife. Children, parents, um, mothers and brothers and sisters, and you know, in our homes, then we have to create, we have to, um, we have to set ourselves on unity, on oneness, on togetherness, on agreement. You, you know, people say you can, you can agree to disagree. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure there's, good, there's, 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 there's a good argument in that as well. You can agree to have a different viewpoint. You know, I might not agree on, 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 on certain things. But it, it, it doesn't, but I can accept the fact that, that you have a different point of view. And I can esteem your, uh, uh, um, your viewpoint as valid to you. You know, I may have a different viewpoint, but that's okay. But it must not disturb the spiritual atmosphere. And so as husbands and wives, as children, as members of, of the same family, be very, very careful. If you want to see the, the, the blessings of God, just open your heart to, to agree agreement with one another and to have this environment shifted and you see the divine blessings and the, and the revelations of God. Just, just open, just, it's just like an open door. And that's, 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 that's what I can say. All right. Um, the Bible also says in the Old Testament, Behold, the Lord your God is one. His nature is one. And so he's drawn to oneness. This is, this is it, isn't it? Eh? You know, the Bible also says um, in Luke chapter 24 that he drew near to them. He drew near to them. They didn't say, hey, what are you doing walking by yourself? Come and, come and join us. No. He drew near, he was attracted to them. It was this, it was this, it's the principle of agreement. It's a principle of oneness that, that drew the Lord. Um, it, in verse 32, it actually says, um, I don't think we read verse 32, we didn't. Let me just read it for you. And they said to one another, this is now the two of them, had, you know, Jesus has now left them. And uh, he, that, that they said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scripture to us. Let me read it, read it again. They said to one another, did not our heart burn within us? Now, if you've got a, um, I know it's in the New American Standard, I think that you'll find that it, it says, did not our hearts, but the New King James says, did not our heart. And the, indeed the Greek, the original translation says, did not our heart burn within us. Which, which, is, which grammatically is wrong, because if there's two of them, there's two hearts. But the Bible says there was one heart. Again, highlighting the fact of oneness. If we are one with one another, if we come into agreement with one another, if we're not fighting one another, we will find the divine revelation of God just flows into our homes, the blessings of God, um, so much more easier. Um, certainly, the, the Bible speaks about one mind, one faith, one baptism, one body, one spirit, one Lord. So this oneness, this agreement drew the Lord. Now, I want to highlight this importance of, 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 of unity and, on, and of being one in the, in, the, in the Old Testament. Let's turn in your Bibles, please, to Nehemiah chapter, chapter 8. Nehemiah, what's happening here now? We've got a little frozen. Let's try again. Let me go a long way around. Nehemiah chapter 8, 
and I want to read from verse from verse 1 it actually says there um, this is ne Nehemiah is, is a, an incredible book this is a, a wonderful book where um, Ezra and Nehemiah have come back from what, and, and uh, a remnant certainly of the people of, of captivity in Babylon they've come, they've come back and they've built they've rebuilt the temple and the city walls the, and the gates and then in verse 8 it says and all the people gathered look at this look at, the, look at the, the words here they gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate look at the setting there were 12 gates around the city as you all know you know all, all got different names the fish gate um, the refuse gate the water gate the, the, the sheep gate the, there's, there's 12 of them but they gathered as one man in front of the water gate, speaking of, of, of the word of God. And they asked Ezra the scribe, they asked him to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the law had given to, to Israel. They had, they, had, they had just come back from Babylon. They had been in captivity for 70 years. Imagine living for 70 years and not having the word of God read to you. I, I, it's... It's, it, it's, it just goes beyond pain when, 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 when you try to think of trying to live your life without the instruction, the admonition, the strength, the life, the beauty of the Word of God, the companionship of the Word of God. The, you know, because His Word is, is, is God. The Word is God. That's what the Bible says in John, John 1. And so what happened here is that under, under Nehemiah's uh, instruction, Ezra who was one of 13 scribes so there's Ezra and 13 that makes 14 that's 2 times 7 you know, 7 being perfection 2 speaking of unity it's the, the, the perfect scriptural leadership that, that comes together and, they, and Ezra stands up on this wooden platform we'll, 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 I don't know if we'll get, it, get there today we, we, we might and uh, um, he stands up and he expounds he explains thoroughly the Word of God. In other words, he explains so that everybody can understand what the Word of God is, 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 is actually saying. And he, he starts at Moses. He starts with the book of Moses now the, uh, and, and, and the law. And he, he read through five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And he, he read for six, he, he explained thoroughly for six hours, the Bible tells us. Six hours, you know. We 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 only generally talk for for an hour, of, uh, you know, and, and and maybe a little bit more if we if we pinch, pinch a bit of your time. And uh, but um, six, they they were standing. My my point in, in in saying this is that I believe that because because they gathered together as one man, because of that oneness principle because of that divine atmosphere that they allowed to envelop them in because of the state of their heart and the orderliness and the soldierliness you know, I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm just in, in my heart I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a group of people that are obedient to the word of God and because, because of that there's a supernatural environment that, that comes upon them as an atmosphere that, that allows them to, to listen to the Word of God for six hours. You know, for, um, for many years, I know that a number of you went to uh, at the Apostolic School of Ministry to the Assoms. Um, I was privileged to go to the, the Sons Fellowship, the Sons Meeting, uh, which often was a week before the, the Apostolic School of Ministry as well. And so for two weeks, we, we would have you know, the Word of God explained to us. We would have it taught to us from morning till evening. And it, it was supernatural, the fact that everybody could be awake. Yes, our bodies got tired, but you know, at, at, at some point, generally because of the heat in, in certain circumstances, but 
the ability to listen, to hear, to understand, to, to retain, to be, to be shifted in the spirit through hours upon... This is because of, I believe, this, 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 the grace of God that falls because of the unity of the spirit that we, that we guard. And we, we, this is why we have to guard the unity of, of the spirit. Um, let's, let me read for you from, from verse 2 of Ezra, uh, from Nehemiah chapter 8. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and the women and those who could understand see the focus on the understanding and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law they said ah, we want more we want more of the word verse 4 so Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose and beside him at his right hand stood Mattitaya, I'm not going to read all these difficult names. They, they really are a mouthful. And I'm just going to go down to verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And, he, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. This is, uh, you know, the, the, the picture in the, uh, uh, in the natural is, is, is amazing but may the Lord impress upon you in your, in your heart and you can see with your eyes what is taking place here that when, when Ezra is, 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 a pra- is a priest and when one who is um, uh, privileged to, to, to relay, to be a postman, to be a donkey to bring the glad tidings of, of, of God into the earth and to be able to explain carefully so that everybody can understand what takes place is that they stood up in, in the natural yes they just they just they got up onto their feet but the word stood up is that word quam I believe it is let me just check let me just check here what's happened I checked it I, it, it, it speaks of you, you, you rise up, you take your place, you come on the scene, your eyes are opened, you're no, you're no longer asleep. Suddenly you know who you are and what you are about. Every, everything come, comes into focus. Why? Because of the clear explanation of the Word of God. Let's bring this back into Luke chapter 24. It would have been so easy for the Lord to reveal himself to these two disciples by saying hey it's me I've risen from the dead look here's the holes in my hands here's you know picks his shirt up and says look there's 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 the, there's the hole in my side look at the holes in my feet it would have been so easy for him to say that but he didn't do that he explained carefully he wanted to reveal himself and the way that he did it he just spoke the word. He expounded, he explained carefully the word of God so that the word of God made sense to, to, to those two, two disciples. Then they could see, and we're going to be obviously having to, to, to carry on with that next, uh, uh, next week. But let me just, our time is, is, is coming to a close. So let, let me just, just read these following scriptures. Just consider these scriptures. In 2 Chronicles chapter 30 and verse 12, it says, The hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. Okay? They, um, the hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded. Uh, uh, commanded by the word of the Lord. In Acts 2.46 Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, 
they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, not hearts. Acts 4.32 says, And the congregation of those who believe were of one heart and soul. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. So there's a, uh, where there's a, basically a, what, I, what, I'm, what I want to highlight is this. Where there's a strong environment of oneness and agreement, there's this incredible capacity of obedience to the Lord that comes, there's, there's this grace of obedience that comes upon a corporate company to obey the, the word of the Lord. Isn't that, isn't that absolutely amazing? Uh, you know, and uh, the norm, generally, I think you'd, you would say is disunity. There's so many churches where there's disunity, and even families there's disunity. But I would like to say that I'm speaking to a first fruit company who's not going to be caught up in all of this. The last scripture I want to read for you is in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 12. It says here, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. There's the two again. You see this? Then these two. Then it says, With all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Can, can you imagine all the people, even in our, even in our corporate church family, could you, could you imagine if everybody was obedient to the voice of the Lord? Imagine if everybody tithed. Imagine if everybody forgave one another. Imagine if everybody just obeyed the word of God in all the different aspects that, that, that are there for them. That we loved one another, that we esteemed one another, that we forgave one another, that, 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 that we were kind to one another, that we were merciful, mm -hmm. that, we, that, we em that, that what emanated from us was the fruits of the Spirit, not, not all these other um, atrocities that, that, that so often slip out. From, from, uh, from people that are not obedient to, to the word. So what, what, we are, what we are seeing here is that where, where, the, where this oneness, where this agreement, where this principle of divine agreement, of oneness is, is, is prevalent, that it shifts the atmosphere. It brings like a corporate grace upon a body, upon a home, upon a family, upon a people, to be obedient to the words of the Lord. Even in, even in, even in, our current, sit, current, sit, even in the current situation in which we are in, I firmly believe that the people of God that are of this apostolic mindset, that, that, are, that are, are walking perfectly before the Lord as far as we possibly can, when our president says, Stay at home. When our president says, wear a mask. When our president, president says, do this or don't do this. We obey. Why? We're not necessarily, you know, obeying a man. But we are obeying a man whom our father says in Romans chapter 13, we, we should obey. So we honor him. We esteem him. And we are so thankful for, for what he has done. He is he has acted in, 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 with, with, with such um, such strength of character, and and I think you know we are all extremely proud of him. But as a people, we are used to being obedient. If you are not trained in obedience, hey, we have got a lot of things to overcome still. But what I want us to just close with, because I, I, I time time has gone now. What I want us to close with is work on. Let's set, our, let, let's set our hearts, let's set our minds to having oneness in our homes. Let's have our, our homes a place where the grace of God is just being poured out for divine revelation because we conduct ourselves accurately and perfectly before the Lord. This is just one aspect of this incredible passage in Luke chapter 24 that we're going to, going to be studying. So, but let me say now, um, as, as is our custom, as is our norm, as is our instruction, let's not forget our, uh, to honour the Lord with our, with our offerings, our tithes, our first fruits, 
um, and let's um, either you know uh, uh, submit it through electronic payments or put it to one side so that when we do get together you can just simply bring it along all right because it's 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 our way of honoring the Lord it's not it's our culture to do it and also I want to encourage you to continue with the cult with our culture of now having communion before the Lord of sharing the the bread and the wine with our family let's love one another esteem one another and create that wonderful um, environment of, of peace and grace unity oneness where the Lord draws near to us and we're not trying to run after him but he is attracted to us I mean it's wonderful to be attracted to somebody isn't it mm -hmm. and I, I trust that you all have somebody that you are attracted to so for me and Sue, from, from, from both of us, uh, we say we, we trust that you'll have a wonderful day, um, a blessed day, walk in the admonition, in the instruction, and the blessings and the love and the care of our Lord. So God bless you as you go, and enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe, and be careful as wherever you go. Thank you.